Hello everyone, welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. And again, this is Seth Mayo, Curator of Astronomy for the Loma Planetarium at the Museum of Arts and Sciences. And in this episode, we're covering the dates of November 8th through November 14th. We're going to start things off by talking about the waxing moon visiting some nice bright planets in the sky this week. Then we're going to say farewell to the constellation of Sagittarius the Archer. And we'll wrap things up with talking about another way to find the North Star without using the Big Dipper. So let's get to it. If you have a chance this week to look in the southwestern part of the sky after sunset, one thing of course you'll notice is that it's getting darker earlier because for a lot of us we went through the end of daylight saving time so keep that in mind when looking at the sky for this week. You'll see a difference for sure. But right at the beginning of the week, right after daylight saving time ends here on Monday evening the 8th, we can find Venus still really, really bright above the southwestern horizon, Venus being the brightest planet that we can see from Earth. And what's nice is the thin waxing crescent moon is nearby, and there you can see it right there. Now, the night before, Sunday night, we actually saw it really close to Venus. We just back up a step here just to kind of go over it again. And there's the waxing crescent, a little thinner of a crescent and really close to Venus there. But for Monday night, the beginning of this week, you'll see it just above and to the left of the planet. So that's always great. And when the moon is crescent, I always mention you might catch a little bit of Earth shine with the moon, the Earth's reflected light reflecting back onto the night side of the moon where you can see some of that dark portion there lit up just a little bit. And it usually happens during some of the thinner crescent phases of the moon. So you will find those two kind of close at the beginning of the week. But as we continue on here, we'll find the moon continue waxing towards the east. And there you'll find it getting a little larger. And then as we get close to first quarter moon, when it's half full on the 10th and kind of the 11th, we'll find then the moon will get near these two gas planets that we still can see very nicely in the south and southwest. You'll find Saturn right here, the beautiful ring planet in our solar system there, which is great. And so that's on the 10th. And then we'll move on to the 11th here, and there you'll find also pretty close to a half-lit moon, technically waxing gibbous because it's a little more than half by the evening of the 11th, but there you'll find it near the planet Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, so that's quite nice as well. And then from then on, as we get into the weekend here, we get into 12th, 13th, and then 14th, you'll see the moon getting more into its gibbous phases and more towards the eastern part of the sky. So it's nice to have the moon near these planets, just reminding you of some of the solar system objects that you can enjoy right now. If we focus back on where Venus is located in the southwest, around the maybe 6.30 p.m. time frame local time here, we can actually find the leftover summer constellation of Sagittarius the Archer, which we find right here. There's Venus being really, really bright, so that can really help you to find this area, finding Venus. And then you can see the stars here. So we talked about this over the summertime. It's one of the best constellations you find at that time of year and for partially the fall as well. Normally when we talk about Sagittarius, we kind of couple that with the constellation of Scorpius, but Scorpius is almost fully set in the sky. You can see a little bit of Scorpius's tail down here, but it's pretty hard to see. You probably won't see much of it. There's a little bit of the tail down there. If I turn off the ground here again, you can see some of it there. But uh, at least aside from talking about Scorpius here, there is Sagittarius, the stars that make it up. And normally when we find this group of stars, which are fairly bright that you can find in this area, we talk about the asterism called the teapot. That's probably the easiest part to find. So if we turn off the constellation lines and turn on just the asterism, there it is. So if you look at it carefully, it does kind of look like a teapot being poured, right? Here is the handle, there is the lid, and there is the spout. Almost makes me want to sing the song, right? But anyway, you can find that teapot there. And what's kind of fun, if you go to a dark enough spot, it almost seems like it's pouring out the stream of the Milky Way. If you go somewhere nice and dark, you may find the Milky Way still really nicely placed in our sky. It's fun to imagine in a dark location that there's some celestial being pouring the teapot and the steam of the tea coming out would represent the Milky Way. So that's kind of fun to imagine there. But anyway, the teapot is a famous asterism that can help you to find the rest of the constellation of Sagittarius. And believe it or not, 
This is a half man, half horse, otherwise known as a centaur. This one's kind of tough to figure out, right? From the stars, a teapot really makes more sense, but when you really try to bend your mind into thinking that it's a centaur, it takes a little more imagination. So the teapot portion here is kind of the torso and head and then part of the bow, because he's an archer. And then the rest of the stars that kind of sort of end up over on this side, a little bit south of the teapot, makes up the horse-like body of this centaur. So this is a very old constellation, maybe one of the oldest in our sky. So it may date back to ancient Babylonian and Assyrian time frames thousands of years ago. And there's not a lot of information about the mythology behind the constellation, and it might be because of how old it is. And there's two competing characters that you find associated with Sagittarius. One is someone named Chiron, who was a famous centaur and the son of Kronos, who's also known as Saturn, he's the father of Jupiter, and a sea nymph named Philyra. So Chiron was known to be very good at archery and hunting and sometimes known as the greatest centaur that ever lived from Greek mythology. So some folks connect Chiron to Sagittarius, but there's actually another centaur in the sky named Centaurus, who also gets the name of Chiron as well. So that's kind of debated. The other character from ancient mythology was described by the famous 2nd and 1st century BC philosopher, poet, and astronomer named Eratosthenes. And he associated Sagittarius with a satyr named Crotus, who was the son of Pan. And Crotus was known as the father of archery and highly regarded as well. So those two names, Crotus or Chiron, sometimes are associated with Sagittarius. It's abated upon. But this, again, is a very, very old constellation. It's been known for quite some time. And that actually relates to some of the stars you can find inside of Sagittarius. If we turn off the picture here, we can kind of zoom in on some of these stars. The brightest star in Sagittarius, you can find it a little bit below Venus here, down here, part of the spout. And so this star here, when we click on it, it's gonna say Cos Australis. Australis just means south, and Cos is Arabic for bow. So this would mean the southern part of the bow, since he is an archer right there. So if you find any star name in Sagittarius with Cos, it means bow. So this one in particular right there, that's called Cos Media, uh, which just means kind of the middle part of the bow. And then we go up to the top here, this is Cos Borealis, which would be the northern end of the bow. Borealis means north there. Then the second brightest star in Sagittarius is quite interesting, and that's the star here where you'd find, at least inside the teapot, which would be the handle, this star you notice at the top left says Nunki. And what's interesting is this is an ancient Babylonian named star, so it's really old, and it might be the oldest named star in the entire sky, which is kind of interesting to think about. At least that's what's thought that might not be the case, but it is a very old named star, possibly named after a city near the Euphrates from Babylonian times. And so that star has a lot of history. And that's one thing I love about sometimes these star names, constellation names, is they can go way back and they can tie us back to people long ago. And so I do love how we're seeing these stars, mostly how people saw them thousands of years ago. And it does connect us with people from other times. So those stars kind of remind you of that. But anyway, we can say farewell to Sagittarius. It's getting really, really low in the sky. You'll find Venus there, and we don't have much more time to see it, but you still have a chance after sunset in the kind of 6 p.m., maybe even a little into the 7 p.m. time frame as it starts to sink lower and lower and as we move farther into the fall. As we shift our attention to the north right now, I do want to mention a very, very famous star that we don't always get a chance to talk about, only once in a while, and that, of course, is our North Star, also known as Polaris. Really famous star, many folks think it's one of the brightest stars in the sky, but in actuality, Polaris, which we can find right there, is about ranked 50th in brightness out of all the stars you can see with your naked eyes. So it really doesn't stand out as much as other stars that you find, but it's still famous because once you find it, you're looking north. Now, normally when I talk about the North Star, I mention finding it with something that's really famous, and that is the Big Dipper. 
Now here in our part of the world, here in Florida, if you're in more southern latitudes, at least in the northern hemisphere, the Big Dipper is not always out. It is a group of stars, an asterism, that you can see really well in the spring and summertime, but then once the fall hits, it dips below the northwestern horizon. You can actually see a little bit of it right now here in Stellarium in our location. Remember, this is latitude dependent, right? So if you look down here in the northwest, you'll see just a little bit of the handle of the Big Dipper after the sun sets right now. And if I turn off the ground again here and turn off the atmosphere, there you see the Big Dipper's handle and the bowl, the seven bright stars of the asterism, when actually this is a constellation called Ursa Major, the Great Bear, very well known in that part of the sky. And the trick that I always talk about, and it's really easy to remember, is you find the Big Dipper, the end of the bowl, those two stars right there can point you straight to, for the most part, to Polaris, the North Star. So it's a really nice, easy trick. The Big Dipper is famous, it's bright, and you can see it for a good part of the year, and that can help you to find the North Star there. Of course, if you don't have a compass or a GPS or a cell phone, it's a fun trick you can use by using the natural lights in the sky. But at this time of year, at least in our part of the world, we can't really see it. Or if you, even if you're farther north, it might be just really low in the horizon, and it's kind of tough. So you may wonder, what's another way to find the North Star. And there's probably a lot of other tricks, but one that I like to use for this time of year is by finding the constellation that looks like a letter W or a letter M. If you look over to the Northeast, you're gonna find the stars of Cassiopeia. I've been talking about Cassiopeia lately, and Cassiopeia is a great fall constellation. This is named after a queen. She was the queen of Ethiopia, married to King Cepheus. And I'll turn on her picture here. She's very well known for being vain. She thought she was the most beautiful creature in the universe, more beautiful than anything, any of the gods or the nymphs. And so you notice she's holding a mirror to her face because she thought she was so gorgeous. She got in trouble for that. Poseidon, the god of the sea, decided to send a sea monster to attack her kingdom. She actually sacrificed her daughter known as Andromeda in this area in her place. And luckily, Perseus, the mighty warrior down here, saved Andromeda. So she's well known for being not the nicest person in Greek mythology, but well-known area of the sky. The stars are fairly bright, and you can find it rising northeast pretty high. So if you do find this W shape, turning off the picture here, what you may notice is the open side of the W, okay, kind of faces the North Star. It's not perfect but it will get you in the right direction if you do find Cassiopeia here. So open side of the W, kind of face that North Star. If you find the North Star, then you can kind of trace out some stars around it that make up the Little Dipper. Here is the handle of the Little Dipper. There is the bowl. The Little Dipper is not as bright as the big one, but once you see those stars, you do kind of see the tiny little spoon-like shape in the sky. I'm gonna draw it for you here. Little Dipper is part of a constellation called Ursa Minor, which means the little bear. So that's another way to find it in our sky using Cassiopeia. I think it's relatively easy. You don't need the Big Dipper if it's not out. And it's always nice to be able to locate that star because you can find every other direction just by finding that particular point. And just as a reminder, the reason why it's our North Star is because our North Pole points right to the star in space, for the most part. If I turn on uh, what's called the equatorial grid, this turns on a huge celestial grid in the sky, and you'll find that the north celestial point is right there. It's not actually perfectly on the North Star, it's off by just a little bit, but it's really close. So the North Star is still decent enough to pinpoint the north there, but it's off by just a little bit. But one thing you'll notice if I turn this off here is if we speed up time and go a little bit farther into the evening here, notice the North Star does not move. We'll go a little faster than that here, and you find it just stationary there, and the star is going around in a counterclockwise direction, and again, that's all because of North Pole of our planet pointing to that star, and as Earth rotates, it makes it look like all the stars are going around it. So if you stay in the same location, the North Star doesn't move unless you move north and south on Earth. So here in Florida and Daytona Beach specifically, where our museum sits, the North Star sits about 30 degrees north of the horizon, so that tells you our latitude. is about 29 to 30 degrees north latitude. So that's kind of a neat trick with that star as well. So if you're having trouble finding the North Star, which is not very bright, and you want to find a little dipper as well, find Cassiopeia, the open side of the W shape of this woman sitting on her throne, facing, or the open side facing the North Star. That can help you to find a great navigational aid in the sky. 
Well, that's it for another edition of our Sky Tonight program. Thank you very much for tuning in. And if you're in the area in Daytona Beach, please stop by the Museum of Arts and Sciences and definitely the Loman Planetarium. We're running shows every single day, so we'd love to have you here for a show. Please check out our schedule online if you want any more information about our programs. So we hope to see you back here again next week for another episode. And as always, happy stargazing. <laughs>